I feel like all technology is, it can be a sort of double-edged sword. Cameras can be used to surveil the population, or they can be used by individuals to, you know, like, expose the state and increase accountability. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word. And so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 36th episode of the show. I'd like to start out this episode by apologizing for the delayed release of this installment. I was hoping to publish this conversation in accordance with our routine schedule, but I've been a bit busier than normal due to some personal developments that have occupied a lot of my time and energy recently. These developments have also moved me to make some important life adjustments, including my decision to step away from non-Servium media. This project requires a decent amount of work to make happen, and I'm deeply appreciative to everyone who has helped make it possible, including the entire non-Servium crew, all of our patrons, guests, and listeners. If you've enjoyed any aspect of this show even a little, please consider supporting the Non-Servium Media Collective through Patreon, as the project will continue after I'm gone. To all who long for freedom, and help make it happen through word or through deed. This one's for you. On this show, we've covered a variety of perspectives on topics surrounding post-state coordination, technology, civilization, anti-capitalism, ecology, and more. And if you've followed us from the beginning, you're probably aware of my personal inclinations towards individualist and mutualist anarchism. Well, it'd be difficult for a petty propagandist like me to not end this season with an episode that focuses more on topics that come into contact with my preferred ideological umbrella. So without further ado, speaking on cryptocurrency, tech development, mutualism, and more, Here's my interview with Railing. Railing is an anarchist without adjectives, interested in economics and markets, who writes for the Center for a Stateless Society and blogs at anarchyreign.tech.blog. Railing, welcome to the show. Hey, Joel. Good to be here. So what's up? How have you been? I've been pretty good. Recently, I've been getting into cryptocurrency. That's kind of been my topic of interest. I tend to get really hyper-focused on different things at different times. So yeah, that's kind of what I'll probably end up talking about a lot. Cool. Well, I definitely do have some questions I want to ask you on that topic. So I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, I mean, I've been tweeting about it 24-7, so (laughs) I feel like uh, people might have noticed that. (laughs) Yeah, you're the person to talk about this kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm stoked to get into it with you. But, you know, before we get into all of the specific questions I have for you about that topic, as well as other topics, you've talked to me off air how you got into anarchy and how you became an anarchist. But why don't you tell the audience how you came to embrace anarchy? Sure. So, I mean, I've had a pretty, like, meandering path towards anarchy. I think I've always sort of had issues with authority. So there's definitely that. But when it comes to adopting the anarchist label, I was, like, living in a different country to my citizenship. And there was, like, this constant threat of deportation, right? Mm -hmm. While I was looking for my job and then 
even after I was employed eventually. So that kind of led me to developing sort of these explicitly anti-state thoughts as a result. So my experience pushed me to look towards like border abolition because like, at least at that time, I was like, yeah, there shouldn't be any requirement for residency status. Like people should just be able to move around wherever they want. And then I sort of came across anarchism. Like I think I typed something into Google, like fuck the state. Uh-huh. or something like that and it came up with anarchy and i was like oh yeah i think this label probably uh, describes my political views quite well <laughs> yeah well i mean that's not a good situation to be in that bureaucratic process is super difficult to work around i was helping a friend not that long ago with his path to citizenship and uh thankfully there was groups like riasis and stuff like that who fundamentally made the the process easier for him but even with that you know between between the banks and the dmv and everything it was just a mess so yeah that sucks but that's interesting that that played a role in your development towards embracing anarchism or the label anarchist yeah so that's how you got into anarchism what convinced you to embrace markets well initially when i first started researching anarchism I guess my first stop was r slash anarchism on Reddit, and mm-hmm. that space sort of leans heavily towards communism, uh, like anarcho-communism. So but I guess when I was starting off, the first resources I was directed towards were mostly like Noam Chomsky. So mm-hmm. I guess my first introduction to anarchism was reading like everything written by Noam Chomsky, like watching all his lectures on YouTube. And then, like, going into different spaces and discussing anarchism with various different people. So those all sort of played a part in me first, like, my very first conceptualization of anarchism. Mm -hmm. But then, like, on Discord and sort of Reddit as well, I started, like, discussing anarchist theory. So, you know, I, I don't know whether, like, this happens with everyone. I think, like, people get very online these days and people tend to like cycle through idea different ideologies a lot Mm -hmm. so like i think i was like an ancom and then i went through sort of like an anti-civ phase although that was more of just the label not not really uh i wasn't much of an anprim at the time i guess i sort of looked at like the, the definition of civilization and how people tend to use the word civilization in like a very sort of elitist and often kind of racist way Mm -hmm. So I was kind of coming at it from that perspective. But then, like, etymologically, civilization refers to, like, cities. So I kind of moved past that point, because I do think cities are compatible with anarchism, like, historically and in the present. But, yeah, so I sort of went down that, like, an ideological rabbit hole. I I think there's a lot of people who sort of go through that process these days. But, like, specifically when it comes to market anarchism, it was mostly just through having discussions with different like anons on discord i honestly haven't read that much theory so i had these sort of debates spanning discord and then reddit uh, some of them kind of heated and i basically came to the general understanding that there's no reason why market exchange necessarily relies on hierarchy doesn't inevitably lead to exploitation and doesn't reproduce hierarchy. So I think I think that's kind of a notion that's kind of uncritically accepted by a lot of left-leaning anarchists. And I think it's becoming increasingly less prevalent, but I might be wrong. It just might be because I'm spending more time, more like a market anarchist circles. But, but yeah, that's basically how I came to market anarchism. Right. So you sort of came from the left initially and then found your way to embracing the promise of markets as a process that is separate from capitalism and reproducing hierarchical capitalist dynamics. So relatedly, it makes me wonder what your thoughts on anarcho-capitalism is. What's wrong with it? I guess like I've been trying to be more charitable towards ANCAPs these days. So... I'll start off with like my more my more like charitable critique of ANCAPs. And I think it's just sort of an underlying philosophical disagreement where 
at least the basis of anarcho-capitalism tends to be like the fixed institution of property rights that's fundamentally grounded in ownership over one's person. Whereas like, I guess from the left, left-wing left anarchist camp, even for ANCOMs, it usually comes down to working backwards from negating hierarchy, which is something ANCAPs don't usually do, and ANCOMs do, even though they they can be kind of inconsistent in those areas. And the sort of emphasis on property rights leads them to advocate prescriptive social relations that may rely on statism at the margins. So I guess one example of this could be ownership going to the first person who mixes their labor with the means of production instead of conceptualizing of ownership as a sort of more fluid social relationship based on negotiations between stakeholders. I guess a concrete example of this could be like a situation where you own a greenhouse and there's someone who who you're allowed to use it and then they end up spending as much time as you laboring on it. And from an ANCAP perspective, you still own the greenhouse. Whereas from a more like mutualist perspective, it really comes down to what the parties involved agree on. So there's really no like fix. We don't really come in with any fixed notion of who that property goes to. Mm -hmm. And like, I think Lockeanism, a non-proviso Lockeanism, which is what ANCAPs base their philosophy on, for the most part, like they have a very consistent reading of it. And even occupancy and use are pretty good rules of thumb. I think if someone has mixed their labor with something, then I think they have they have a valid claim to ownership over it. But I also think there's like some blurriness at the edges, and ANCAPs sort off of, at those margins. Their solution is often one that could be grounded in authority. So, for example, like there's no one who could come in and enforce that the greenhouse belongs to the person who like first makes their labor in it. Like it's something that the parties have to navigate. So, I guess for mutualists, we view property more as like a social relationship where there's no fixed basis for property. So that's my charitable critique of ANCAPs from like a foundational perspective. Mm -hmm. But that aside, I think that like ANCAPs are just, at least least for ANCAPs that are consistent in the anti-statism, I just disagree with the definition of capitalism. It's not a free market, but an economic system where the state intervenes in a like commodity-driven economy to enforce economic rents by privileging some groups. And I guess for those ANCAPs who aren't at all consistent, they're just like closer to neo reactionaries like Hoppians who just want like a patchwork of nation states. Okay. So on our last episode, I spoke with an individual named Travid, and he pointed out how the Austrian story of money creation, which goes something like, currency was created to make barter exchange more efficient. Travid pointed out that this is essentially a fiction and that the actual historical evidence points more towards money being created to pay soldiers and necessarily growing out of authoritarianism. He also pointed out how there were non-commercial currencies that existed as well. So One challenge that he posed to market anarchists was it's questionable as to whether or not or the extent to which markets would actually be a thing without the state. And specifically with the currency question, how can you have commercial currency without a state? So there's definitely parts of that which I agree with. So the part I agree with is that money did not originate from barter. I guess what I disagree with there is maybe how money is being defined. Because, at least from a historical standpoint, societies did use mutual credit to make transactions that are stateless societies, where debits and credits were recorded in ledgers and then periodically settle, settled, which I would classify as a form of money. So, I, I guess there may be a slight difference in definitions over there, where a lot of people see money as simply like a form of coinage. Mm-hmm. as opposed to sort of a system of exchange that's based on credit. 
And like David Graeber discusses some examples of peasant societies in the Dark Ages adopting such examples. And there's also modern examples in Mexico where people have set up these networks of like community-based mutual credit currencies that don't use the Mexican peso and use their own sort of mutual credit currency. So I think I think there's definitely historical and present day examples of money that doesn't involve a state. But then like going back to that statement, I would agree that like coinage was typically associated with states and was implemented to tax presidents and pay soldiers, you know. The introduction of coinage to use James C. Scott's terminology was was also part of making these societies more legible because if everything sort of if all the transactions are stored on local ledgers or even like or not even necessarily quantified in ledgers, then it would be pretty difficult for the state to tax these people and also integrate them into the state. I guess that's sort of how I see it from a historical perspective. But more recently, I guess we, we also have a blockchain technology, which is basically a list of records stored in a public distributed ledger that no single user can unilaterally edit. And these ledgers rely on a digital form of coinage called cryptocurrencies to incentivize node operators to validate transactions on the network. So what's cool about blockchain tech, at least for me, is that it allows you to make transactions without having to trust your counterparty or any intermediaries. It doesn't require permission to access the network, and it's sometimes even anonymous. Technically, your identity on a blockchain is just a public key, which is completely anonymous, and then that can be compromised if you if you make transactions with yourself using, say, like a centralized exchange where you're doxed. But on a high level, blockchain technology allows a network of computers to validate transactions where the compliance of each node is managed by a program set of incentives, which is called a consensus protocol. Whereas, like you know, in our traditional financial system, centralized entities like the Federal Reserve and banks that many people are privileged enough to be able to trust tend to validate the transactions. So technically, with cryptocurrencies, there is an element of trust, but you don't trust the goodwill or discretion of any individual. So for example, like if you make a payment through Patreon or any other centralized payment processor, and any centralized entity within the traditional financial system, like PayPal or anything else, they have the option to block your transactions, they could audit your transactions, they could basically cut you out of the financial system. But with a cryptocurrency, you don't have to trust any of that. What you really trust is this network of incentives, is the system of incentives or the consensus protocol. And uh, as, as many people say, that's just like math. Right. Uh, the reason we have consensus protocols is to prevent attacks on the network, like civil attacks, where attackers attempt to gain control of 51% of the nodes, allowing them to effectively control the network and make any transaction they want, just like any centralized payment and processor would. And also, the consensus protocol aims to sort of disincentivize the validation of malicious blocks by individual nodes. And those blocks are basically like, you know, a set of transactions that may contain like a double spend or something like that. And I guess one example of a consensus protocol is proof of work, where validators have to consume energy for the right to validate transactions and receive a block reward and transaction fees for each block mine. And they do this to cover the energy cost. The energy cost is what makes it very difficult for a single miner to capture 51% of the nodes in the network in a sufficiently decentralized network. If the network isn't decentralized, then it's pretty easy for them to capture 51% of the nodes. But like in order, like for example, with Bitcoin, if, if you wanted to if you wanted to control all of the nodes, you'd have to utilize an absolutely huge amount of energy. And then this cost also creates an incentive for miners not to validate malicious blocks because the block would simply be rejected by the rest of the network and they'd have wasted energy, the energy used to mine the block. And 
Another very popular uh, consensus protocol is proof of stake, which is a system where validators stake tokens for the right to validate transactions. So you basically have your Ethereum and you stake it, and that's what allows you to act as a validator. And in order for this system to work, like unlike proof of work, where the incentives are managed by the use of electricity, the token act itself acts as a fixed or of value, unlike in mutual credit systems where the value is sort of, the credit actually isn't, isn't a commodity. And they do this to make it extremely expensive for attackers to acquire enough, enough tokens to stage a civil attack, which as an aside is partly why they introduced burning coins in this new Ethereum upgrade, the London hard fork. Although people focus more on how it makes ETH deflationary and makes everyone richer. And in proof of stake, the validation of malicious blocks is disincentivized by the protocol cutting a portion of stake tokens. And then besides that, there's a lot of different consensus protocols and variations of proof of work and proof of stake. Some are pretty waste wasteful, like proof of storage, where validators fill hard drives with junk data for the right to validate transactions. It's kind of like proof of work, but with storage space. So there's really no end to creativity. And that's kind of like, I kind of see like a lot of innovation for how you could organize commercial currencies without a state. There's definitely a lot of use value there, like not only in making unauthorized transactions, but also in terms of like transacting with people you don't necessarily trust and transacting over long distances, which I think would be part of like even an anarchist economy going to the future like under the state it's 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 very useful to have cryptocurrencies for unauthorized transactions but you know i think i think the use case extends beyond that as well so i was watching the newest season of curb your enthusiasm last night <laughs> and i promise this is relevant there is a a quick little line by pat oswald the centrist liberal comedian that everyone loves where he said uh cryptocurrency is real quick cryptocurrency is basically for nazis and nerds nazis <laughs> wow nazis and nerds. <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> it's like nerds okay uh nazis ah, i don't know about that it's kind of amazing how far liberals will go to like vilify cryptocurrencies <laughs> <laughs> exactly but i guess stepping back from that a little bit I think cryptocurrencies are generally seen just as support for markets are sometimes seen as sort of a right wing thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So isn't cryptocurrency just for sort of people who are more likely to embrace right wing libertarianism? Just first of all, regarding what you said about cryptocurrency being used by Nazis, I actually remember an article where I, I don't remember what which news outlet it was from, but I think it was like it was talking about how the alt right receive donations in crypto and Bitcoin. And I think it's just it's just such a disingenuous tactic where it's like you're pointing at how a technology is used and then just ignoring like every other use case and just focusing on this one particular way in which it's used in order to sort of, you know, smear the entire thing. I think it's just like a straight up fallacious argument. Sure. And not to mention like, you know, all of the explicitly left-wing projects that are happening with blockchain technology too i mean you see um the, i forget the name of this one group what do they call blockchain socialist i think or something like that oh yeah yeah i've, I've seen i've seen that person on twitter but yeah um on, on, on the question of whether like whether crypto is just something for right-wing libertarians i would say no even though it is favored by right-wing libertarians and very much vilified by left libertarians and really the left in general. It's already been used by social movements that align with very much anarchist goals and even leftist goals. One example would be Bitcoin being used to fund an anti-police brutality movement in Nigeria mm. um, after the movement was basically banned from the traditional financial sectors. Mm -hmm. Some other examples include Cryptocurrency is being used by to make just unauthorized transactions in general. I personally know un undocumented people who use cryptocurrency 
to first of all get paid for their jobs. You know, like if they're working as maybe a dev or something like that, then it makes sense to be paid in, in cryptocurrency and not have your you know finances audited by the state. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of these people are just are just unable to work in most positions because they it, it basically has to go through the legal system. Like all employment has to go through the legal system, and like you know the transfer of cash is also validated by the Federal Reserve. So there is definitely that component of it. Undocumented people also use it to make remittances. There's instances where sex workers use cryptocurrency to make an income. You know, like if you look at the statistics for countries with relatively high rates of of cryptocurrency adoption, you see countries like Nigeria, where I read an article recently about how police were arresting people near ATMs, and the article just didn't really provide much context on it. But I would assume that it had something to do with the anti-police brutality movement. Yeah. That was happening there. It's also used heavily in Vietnam and also recently the Philippines, actually. Mm. In, in the Philippines, they had a pretty um, interesting situation where an NFT based blockchain game called Axie Infinity basically allowed people to uh, make an income through the pandemic. So that was a pretty interesting use case. Like people, people basically playing these play to earn video games to make an income but yeah there's like there's like this very particular group of of very online i guess very out of touch leftists who selectively ignore these developments and focus on spreading like i guess these media i I would just call it media propaganda on cryptocurrency Mm -hmm. i think a lot of it stems from this general anti-money sentiment we find in leftism which is a result of the Marxist influence in mainstream leftist thought. Mm-hmm. Some of it comes from the, this false notion that crypto has a negative impact on the environment. Some of it also comes from the fact that a lot of people have made a lot of money from crypto, which I would honestly, like, I, I think that is a, very much a capitalist dynamic mm-hmm. that has entered crypto. And I, I think that that's really tied to like this wider bubble tied to the debt cycle and not something inherent to cryptocurrencies. So going off of the fact that there's some nuance when it comes to cryptocurrencies being tied to more capitalist dynamics, what are some legitimate critiques that you have heard of cryptocurrencies? So yeah, I think I think there are some very much valid critiques of cryptocurrency that specifically focus on how a lot of players end up accumulating quite a lot of economic rent. And I think that specifically stems from the fact that a lot of these cryptocurrencies rely on artificial scarcity. So mining Bitcoin is expensive due to high levels of competition over hash rate. A small miner wouldn't be able to break even on energy costs given their probability of getting assigned a block. So basically, early miners can reinvest Bitcoin into like ASIC mining rigs, and then they have an advantage driven that's technically just driven by the consensus protocol and isn't really something that that comes from like you know external capitalist dynamics. So there's definitely elements of path dependency there, which allows miners to sort of accumulate quite a lot of wealth and. Really, it's it's more of a technological problem with blockchain because the energy consumption, the hash rate, and the artificial scarcity of the currency are very much necessary aspects to create the incentives for miners to not mine, prevent the civil attacks, and prevent the validation of malicious nodes. And so when we have a similar issue with proof of stake, where stakers also capture rents through path dependency. So If we take Ethereum as an example, people who participated in the pre-sale and didn't sell their tokens have probably made like a very large amount of wealth. And those who end up staking their tokens, you know, those very large holders of Ethereum can then stake their tokens, you know, accumulate 
wealth in that way. So in, in both these cases, we have this interesting situation where the technology itself, irrespective of state intervention, does lead to um, a degree of wealth accumulation. But then like, you know, in, in response to some of these critiques, there's definitely like the crypto community is very much aware of these dynamics and there have been there's a lot of examples of you know innovation with consensus protocols that aim to mitigate this red seeking so you know one example is the delegated proof of stake system which is a consensus mechanism used by blockchains like cosmos where users can stake their tokens to a validator as part of the blockchain so that way like you know the staking rewards are directly allocated to users through these different, you know, who stake their tokens with different validator nodes. You could also do this on Ethereum by staking to mining pools, but it isn't part of the consensus protocol, so it isn't, I guess, uh, decentralized. And there's also coins like Nano, where there's zero transaction fees. Although this comes with trade-offs, like uh, there's a huge amount of spam on the network. The only the only incentive for holders of Nano to basically stake their tokens is benefiting from the network itself and the appreciation of the token. So that, that that's kind of similar to how networks like BitTorrent work. Like there's no there isn't necessarily any financial incentive for people to seed their torrents, but people do it anyways because you know there's like they they, they benefit from the network itself. And then in, the, in addition to that, like BitTorrent recently has have, has recently launched its own like cryptocurrency on Ethereum, which allows users to also provide incentives to you know people seeding torrents and stuff like that. So so I think I think there's always like there's still like a use for cryptocurrencies to manage incentives on the internet. And then there's also like relatively inflationary coins like Dogecoin, where the miners accrue relatively less economic rent because there's just more tokens entering circulation. And then in addition to that, if we're making apples to apples comparisons, I don't really see why consensus protocols are inherently more costly than having to trust an entity, like uh, even in a sort of anarchic context where there's no state. So there's, there's, it's quite obvious that consensus, having these consensus protocols in place and you know the rent, the the rent that they result in is worth it for a lot of people. Like they pay these rents to use these blockchains. You know they they deal with all the issues that come with it, like these very relatively high transaction fees, the volatility of the tokens, and you know various things like that, because they can't really afford to trust the centralized centralized intermediaries like the state and you know various payment processors, but. You know, even even in an anarchist context, trust is scarce, albeit not artificially scarce. And using a decentralized ledger is still underpinned by scarcity, where you have path dependency through the accumulation of social capital. So when I say decentralized ledger, I mean like something we might see in like a mutual credit system. And I see very few exceptions to this. Like people willing to form social networks have an advantage in a stateless context. So really, if you ask me if the artificial scarcity has a useful function to people, and I do find crypto pretty useful, then have at it. I I would argue that blockchain tech really cheapens trust in all contexts and diminishes the social cap, the dynamics of social accumulation, because it really, it gives people an exit. Like, if so, if like your, your real life social relationships aren't working out for you and you know, you're unable to, it, it's, it's relatively difficult for someone to navigate the dynamics of social capital, then they can pretty easily exit onto the blockchain. And I think this is really important in light of like how ANCOMs um, want to structure their societies, which is essentially predicated on maintaining goodwill with people. And and really, if I was if I was to go a step further, I would say that even though market transactions are more explicit and more suited to certain people than communal relations, you know, like tit for tat exchange is much less dependent on having goodwill in a society. 
these transactions do still rely on trust. So, you know, the fact that blockchain tech is completely trustless and permissionless means that it's, at least for me, it's always going to have a place, you know, now in, in, in pretty much all contexts, not just uh, under a state. We're trying to make unauthorized transactions, which is also useful in a stateless context. So I want to spend just a little more time on cryptocurrencies, if you don't mind, and then we can move on to sort of like maybe some tech questions more broadly, and then on to some projects that you have going on personally, or a project you have going on. So you mentioned earlier that there are environmental concerns regarding cryptocurrencies. What are your thoughts generally on crypto and ecology? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of discourse on the internet quite recently. I think cryptocurrency has just been in the spotlight a lot recently because of like, you know, the the NFT surge and, and the whole bubble. And people have really been focusing on how cryptocurrencies uh, allegedly, well, not allegedly, they do use a lot of electricity. So I think, I think it's definitely an important area to address. Although a lot of the people, you know, making the claims are very much kind of disingenuous, if you ask me. But my sort of overall position on this is that it's no worse than any other system that consumes electricity. So, so firstly, people make the mistake of arguing that crypto in general uses huge amounts of electricity. But this really depends on the consensus protocol. So proof of stake uses as much energy as any other network of computers. They don't have to consume energy for the right to validate transactions. So from the outset, the notion that crypto is bad for the environment is a pretty huge generalization. But even when it comes to proof of work, there's some important things people miss. So firstly, the the opportunity cost of a large portion of the energy used to mine Bitcoin is basically zero because the miners locate themselves close to remote power generation facilities to capture cheap energy that would have otherwise just dissipated. So like there's a lot of Bitcoin mines located like basically in the middle of nowhere, like these isolated coal power plants, China, like relatively isolated, like geothermal plants in Iceland. And a lot of like when the energy is traveling to urban areas, a lot of it just it would it would just dissipate and that's just, you know, rerouted into Bitcoin mining. So there's really not much environmental impact there. And I guess my, my second point is that Bitcoin mining is already powered by renewable energy, although the estimates of the portion vary quite widely, the highest being about 74%. Then another point, which I guess is a bit less obvious, is that Bitcoin mining incentivizes clean energy because it can be located pretty much anywhere. And right now, like the cheapest energy is off solar. So if you have an area with good conditions for solar energy, but there aren't many people living in the surrounding area, having a Bitcoin mining operation in the vicinity could effectively create an incentive to invest in that solar capacity. So Bitcoin effectively makes it more, makes solar more feasible in these kinds of issues. In other words, it gives energy producers a lot of flexibility to seek out the cheapest possible options, right? Like it allows energy producers to solve, you know, really be more flexible with the location. And one response to all this is, is that it's just unnecessary. You know, you don't need Bitcoin mining. You don't need a Bitcoin miner to like that that power doesn't need to be generated in the first place to power Bitcoin mining. And I guess my response to that would be that it's a waste of energy is a subjective evaluation. Mining Bitcoin definitely is not a waste for a lot of people. Like I try to be charitable when it comes to these arguments, but often I'm really just tempted to post this graphic showing that gaming consumes more energy than mining crypto <laughs> because uh you know a lot of people view gaming as a waste of time mm -hmm. and of course people respond saying that it's like that's like a sort of prohibitionist approach which i would say is correct so then maybe instead of like dictating how much people use energy a more like anarchist anarchic solution is to change the energy mix mm -hmm. 
So, and then my final point is really that Bitcoin's energy use is very arbitrarily singled out. I read this uh, article by Nick Carter, who, who basically like who writes very extensively on this topic. Like I get all my points from his work, and I think one of the best points he made is that like our fiat currencies that we use every day is basically backed by the military of every government in the world. And, like that's that's the cost. Every like global consensus protocol, if you, if you want to call it that, like you know, the process through which governments come to decisions is really backed by violence. So from that perspective, you could say that the money we use every day is much more environmentally harmful than Bitcoin because people people forget that cryptocurrency, it includes like the full stack. It includes like validation of the cryptocurrency. It includes the settlement. It, it's also like a settlement layer. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, at least, at least in like the traditional financial system, the reason you, a lot of people can trust banks and centralized payment processes is because the government provides certain guarantees. Like it's the guarantee doesn't come from like a network of incentives. The, the guarantee comes from the government saying that if for example, Citibank for, for whatever reason, like drains the money from your account, then you could go to the government and legally dispute that. And while obviously the government is going to probably favor Citibank, that the guarantee that that really that the guarantee, like the, the process of validation is sort of backed by the state. So I, I think that's definitely something people don't consider when they sort of blindly critique uh, cryptocurrencies. Mm-hmm. You mentioned NFTs. What are they? And what are your thoughts on them? I mean, there's been some, seems like some controversy surrounding them online a lot, actually, recently. What do you have to say about all this? Yeah, I mean, the, the NFT discourse is, is basically like, I, th- I think I've had to like mute and block like uh, a huge amount of a huge, massive number of people on Twitter for the sort of bad takes on the NFT discourse. Even though, again, it's, you know, it's one of those situations, just like, you know, critiques of cryptocurrency, where I think there are valid critiques, but very few people are making them. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's an, it's like an interesting phenomenon, especially given what an NFT actually is, which is just like a unique token stored in a blockchain with an optional metadata extension that can contain a URI, which is basically just a hyperlink. So it's literally a non-fungible token. And just given what they are, I didn't expect to see this huge moral panic over them. Like I first encountered NFTs in 2017 when I first got interested in cryptocurrencies. And I just I just sort of looked at it and I was like, well, this seems I don't really get it. I don't get why people are buying these things. It it it's, it seems kind of silly. And now we've got like this huge moral panic over NFTs, like massive amounts of outrage. So I, I, I've, been, I've been sort of trying to get my head around that because it's kind of people getting angry over like, you know, units of data stored in a database. Like, uh, at least on Twitter, I've seen people, I've seen artists getting death threats and like, there's these like massive groups of thousands of leftists who, who like threaten artists for selling NFTs. So I, I kind of think it helps to deconstruct the whole thing. So I guess, I guess to begin with, some of the outrage is based on falsehoods regarding a blockchain tech and not understanding what an NFT actually is. I've seen a lot of people say minting and buying NFTs uses energy, which is wrong. As we've covered, energy use depends on the consensus protocol. And there's many NFTs on like proof of stake blockchains and various others. And then if we're looking at proof of work blockchains like Bitcoin and currently Ethereum, which is going to be moving to proof of stake is that, that you know, like by minting and like buying and selling NFTs has no bearing on the energy use of the blockchain itself because new coin issuance, because, because energy use sort of like scales with new coin insurance issuance. So basically like even a block that, that contains zero transactions would still be mined. So minting an NFT, which is basically a transaction, really has no impact on that. Like the block will be mined regardless of whether you 
mint an NFT or buy or sell an NFT. So, so that's all for completely misinformed critique. And then another thing people do a lot is that they conflate NFTs with tokenized artwork, which is one particular manifestation of NFTs, which I'll get to later. But the thing is that, is that they can really be used for a lot of different things. So, you know, against Utopia on Twitter has this really great thread about how NFTs can be used in the market for recycled waste, where the NFT is used to represent recycled waste that corporations can then bid on. And the tokenization of this waste on a public blockchain allows anyone to enter the market and compete on a, la- on a level playing field, specifically migrant laborers who work as scrap collectors and are paid far less for their labor than like the large recycling corporations. So, you know, putting everything on to a distributed like public ledger means that the, these corporations are just bidding on waste. The person they're buying from doesn't factor into it as much. It's, it's just, at the end of the day, it's just waste on a blockchain. So that, that, that's one like pre, I, I think it's a pretty liberatory utilization of NFTs. So yeah, I mean, I guess generalizations of NFTs aside, the real moral panic that we're seeing is aimed at art NFTs and gaming NFTs. These are the two sectors that are specifically targeted by people. And I guess beneath the falsehoods and like the overreaction, there are some decent critiques. Technically, owning an NFT doesn't give one ownership over the art itself because ownership allows one to exclude others. But that's just how we define ownership. Whereas digital art can be infinitely reproduced. So it makes sense for people to ridicule the phenomenon just based on how they define ownership. People are basically paying for a token with a hyperlink to a file. It's kind of like buying a star. So one could argue that they're intrinsically worthless and therefore a scam. The context in which they have value is presumed to be a bubble or capitalists like flexing their wealth. And there's definitely elements of truth to this. With NFT gaming, NFTs are used to reference in-game items. And what makes it different from art is that a game creates a stable context for these NFTs to retain value. Usually the outrage is more often than not people just having a knee-jerk opposition to NFTs. So it's like, we hate our NFTs. And then it's like, oh, fuck, they're bringing them to gaming. Like, these NFTs are ruining everything. I would say the actual valid criticism here also applies to pretty much all video games, which is that devs and, you know, gaming corporations can accumulate artificial scarcity rent by selling things that aren't actually scarce, like in-game items. So, you know, technically, the only way to compensate content creators without them benefiting from scarcity rents by charging users for data that can, is basically not scarce at all, it can be infinitely copied, is them to either charge for services or for people to just donate what they want. And as someone who wants to, solve, who wants to like minimize economic rent and pirates all media, I, I agree with the general sentiment behind this. That said, I don't see why NFT should be singled out, but not, you know, Netflix, but games that sell in-game items and other services that pay world users to access digital content. What NFTs in gaming really do is just redistribute rent to users instead of concentrating them in the hands of gaming corporations by just creating an economy for in-game items that can be converted to real money. So it's kind of like um, CSGO skins, except uh, nobody actually controls the economy. And I guess I, I, I see this as better than the alternative because while it's obviously not ideal, when in-game and economy spell into real life anyway, with people selling characters and accounts, it's kind of helpful to have those, you know, I guess, I guess those rents go to users instead of concentrated in these massive corporations. Although I, I guess that's just, you know, it, it's, it's just my opinion on it. But really, this, this whole phenomenon actually sort of brings up a philosophical question for me, which most people aren't really willing to discuss because they're so enraged by, like, basically databases, which is that people are treating NFTs linked to files stored somewhere as a form of ownership, even though it isn't by definition. 
although it may be hard to believe, I actually know people who buy NFTs because they genuinely see it as owning art or some sort of digital identity with no with no speculative motive. Like I don't I personally don't really get it, but it comes down to a cultural conflict between two different definitions of ownership. Like right now in the in the crypto space you have this whole sort of metaverse narrative and there's definitely elements of a bubble there. But the whole sort of idea behind it is to bring the real world online including the sort of bad bits like artificial scarcity like you see all these slogans out there where people call bitcoin digital gold and ethereum dig digital oil and now in the nft market you're literally seeing people like buying digital land even though like you know it's not scarce at all like there's there's an infinite amount of digital land my response to that is that it's it's sort of more funny than infuriating it's it's just like people scamming over scamming each other on the internet but you know like what really makes me sort of sort of hesitate on this is that saying these nfts are worthless is more of a moral assertion than an observation of what's actually going on in the nft market like there's people who claim that bitcoin has no intrinsic value or isn't a money or isn't money for whatever reason and I think that focusing on semantics instead of looking at what what's actually happening, motivated reasoning aside. So with NFTs, there's like there's a clear demand for NFTs, no matter how much we dislike the narrative of NFTs. And I and I do honestly dislike the narrative behind NFTs in a lot of these contexts. I, I guess like a similar phenomenon is people paying for services like Netflix, even in places where there's no legal consequences to piracy and Pirated content is available in the exact same form through things like uTorrent, uTorrent streaming sites, web apps like Popcorn Time. There's a lot of information asymmetry, and at least my hypothesis on that, or my hypothesis on why this information asymmetry is so persistent, is that it's partly just a function of people not like giving a fuck. They're just like they'll pay for this stuff, like they'll just do it for the for like cultural reasons. Interesting. So this makes me sort of want to think about the larger implications of tech development in general. Throughout the history of the podcast, we have spoken with tech optimistic people who identify as transhumanists. And we've also spoken with people who they have some hesitations to embracing sort of like a transhumanist sort of perspective because in the technology world, you have so much overlap with power, right? You have so much overlap with the state and problems that industry and authoritarianism have when they collide. So I'm just curious, you seem to be tech optimistic generally. What makes you feel that way? So in an abstract sense, I'm optimistic on most forms of tech. I guess excluding, so I guess, egregious examples like nuclear weapons, because they create new possibilities and therefore more, more ways for people to form social relationships that aren't influenced by the state. You know, like, I feel like all technology is, it can be a sort of double-edged sword. Cameras can be used to surveil the population, or they can be used by individuals to, you know, like, you know, expose the state and increase accountability so there's so many examples like that like there's the internet you know that, that's a pretty obvious one where it's created like a lot of new mechanisms for rent extraction there's a lot of surveillance features on the state a lot of internet infrastructure is controlled by the government well not the government but like corporations but at the same time the internet allows people to sort of network or form anti-government co coalitions and allows people to form ideas so you know i'm i, I would honestly describe myself as sort of tech neutral where i'm personally pretty much open to technological development i try not to take a stance against any technology in and of itself and focus more on how the technologies are actually implemented by the state or by people who are sort of pervading the state. So 
I think it's it's also a very contextual question. Okay, cool. So what are some more liberatory tech projects that you feel optimistic about? There's so much out there. So there's a few like specific examples that I've been looking into quite recently beyond stuff like uh, DIY tech and 3D printed guns. You know, sort of going back to crypto, I found that like the innovation of DAOs, which is basically a decentralized autonomous organization that's hosted on the blockchain, is sort of fairly like novel way of coordinating. I mean, they've been around since about you know 2017 and 2018, but I think that they're, they're receiving increasing adoption. And what's cool about them is that it allows users to maintain an, an anonymity by allowing them to transact without any trusted intermediaries that stipulate that users dox themselves. And this is pretty much the case under capitalism. It's pretty much always the case under capitalism because of KYC requirements. And I think like anonymous culture is something anarchists should value a lot. Some more specific examples also in the blockchain space is a liquidity protocol, which is basically um, a protocol for zero interest loans. Anarchists, especially mutualists, focus on how interest on loans is a form of economic rent because credit technically isn't scarce. Anyone can issue credit and in a competitive market, um, that's eventually going to drive the cost of credit near or to zero. And it's pretty interesting to see like this protocol that allows users to take out zero interest loans on the blockchain and you know it it definitely lowers the cost of financing for a lot of people who you know may end up using this product although one caveat is that these loans are fully collateralized because of the trustless nature of the system one interesting project that i've been listening um, looking at recently and i've seen it get i've seen it get some interest on uh, anarchist twitter as well mostly from people who are interested in like game theory which is uh, Klima DAO, which is basically like, I, I guess you could say it, it's sort of like a, a black hole for carbon credits and, and also kind of a bit of a Ponzi scheme where basically you have a system where users buy these Klima DAO tokens, which are issued by the DAO. They receive Klima in exchange and these tokens end up in these liquidity pools in automated market makers and automated market makers are just blockchain technology that allow people to make swaps between different cryptocurrencies without having a counterparty so there's no matching process involved each of these automated market makers has to have a liquidity pool so different pairs of tokens in this case it would it could be something like the klima dao token and the us dollar coin and what you can do then is that um, users can basically stake these liquidity tokens in these liquidity pools in the automated market makers to provide liquidity for some compensation. It's, it's kind of a complicated system, honestly, but the, the automated market maker mints tokens to compensate people for providing liquidity. And people can take these liquidity tokens, which is basically a pair of tokens, and then sell them back to claim our DAO. And these liquidity tokens go into the DAO's treasury, which is then used to purchase carbon credits. And as the treasury grows, users are paid. Uh, the protocol mints Klima DAO tokens and pays them out to users. So basically, you get a yield for participating in the system. In the system, and as more as more money, as as more cryptocurrency enters this protocol, they manage to buy like uh, more and more carbon credits. And the current APY on this is like, I think 50,000% a year. And I haven't really considered the implications of economic rent. Like there's definitely economic rent accruing to the people who are, who are pretty early to the whole system. But I just find it interesting that people have managed to create the system where they're making carbon credits artificially scarce by just buying huge amounts and doing nothing with them, which then means that corporations have much less a scope to emit carbon. So I thought I thought that was a very interesting blockchain product. I think there's a lot of these very interesting and, and I, I, I guess very much obscure projects coming out of cryptocurrency that just operate 
on the principles of game theory. So speaking of projects, you and I have been sort of developing something that is at least worth mentioning. Could you explain a little bit about what we have going on? Yeah, so recently you and I and a few others have been working on a new project called mutualismcoop.com, which is an anarchist collective that's focused on exploring anarchist thought from an explicitly mutualist perspective. And we're going to be putting out articles and audio files. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting the project off the ground. For sure, me too. I guess we've sort of been speaking about it as if it's um, a place to collect classical texts for mutualist writings, as well as a place for people to get information on contemporary newer developments, because mutualism is not a a static thing with strict canon, although there are some pretty important figures in the philosophy that should be read. And there's also some really important and interesting disagreements about what mutualism is, what are the implications. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to continuing to pursue this project with you. And I think if any of the listeners out there are interested in learning more about mutualism, which is for what it's worth, one of the oldest or arguably the oldest form of anarchy or anarchism, then mutualismcoop.com is going to be a good space for you to go to to learn more about that sort of stuff. But Railing, someone hearing about this might say, so what's the difference between mutualism co-op and C4SS or the mutualist section of the anarchist library? What do you have to say about that? I guess what makes mutualismcoop.com different from C4SS and other organizations is that we plan on focusing more on mutualist thought, which I would say is a relatively neglected topic in anarchist philosophy. You know, you go online and a lot of people don't really know what mutualism is. And I think it's definitely uh, an area that really deserves a lot more exploration. Yeah, so not just a place to collect random articles about the topic, but, you know, it would be cool to just tackle very specific topics such as certain assumptions that are made about mutualists, which is like, you know, aren't mutualists just fence sitters in between communism and capitalism? Or aren't mutualists uh, just like secret ANCAPs waiting to like infiltrate (laughs) anarchist spaces or... You know, all these all these silly things that are normally associated with the topic, right? Capcom gang. Capcom, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Capitalist communism. Free market communism, though, is pretty dope, to be honest. Yeah, it's the best form of communism. Hell yeah. Very much non-contradictory. Exactly. So for all these provocative ideas, go to mutualismcoop.com to find more about all this fun stuff but when is the launch date when can listeners expect to see this happen we're probably aiming for sometime early next year all right so where can folks go to follow you and your work railing i guess you can find me on twitter at railing 56 and i'm also active on discord all right Are there any good resources you'd recommend folks check out in order to learn more about any of the stuff we've discussed today? There's not much information on anarchism and cryptocurrencies. There's also not many critiques of cryptocurrency from an anarchist perspective. Personally, like, given that there's not much literature on that, I think I would just recommend people follow certain certain individuals on Twitter. Dystopia Breaker is definitely one of them. Cupid hack. There's probably a few others, but I, I think this is definitely like a developing, a very much developing area. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of it. So, in addition to that, I think uh, Against Utopia is another good person to follow on that. And then, of course, Richard Barlett is also an interesting voice in, in that space as well. Oh, yeah, I definitely agree. All right, Railing, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you being on for the last episode on the non-Servian podcast, at least where I am hosting. Uh, But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me.
you've had a lot of good things to say that I think are going to at least put rocks in people's shoes uh, on this topic and, and these surrounding uh, the surrounding issues concerning tech and crypto and all that. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been it's been good. Absolutely. Well, I will see you on the other side. Talk to you soon. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviamedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviamedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviamedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.